that's the main reason that I do it, not preserve our own family history, but other people's. And you know, people can come in and, and you'd be surprised that people come in and say, you know, I can remember my dad wearing a uniform just like that, or I can remember my husband uniform. My, my husband's a Vietnam veteran. This uniform looks just like his. He was a Purple Heart recipient, or he was a Bronze Star recipient. And they, it brings back a lot of memories for him. And it's, it doesn't belong stuffed in a closet someplace put on the back burner where nobody sees it. Try to encourage families and people and when I talk to the kids, I always tell them, I said, you know, when you go home, talk to your mom, your dad, your grandparents, aunts, uncles, find out who in your family was in the military and get it recorded. And I said, I call it pass it on. You pass it on from one generation to the next. Back in uh, 2003, uh, Dave Tiki, my buddy, brought the moving wall into Lawrenceburg and he called me. He said, hey, I'm gonna need some help on this. I said, Dave, I'm working an outage. We're working 14, 15, 16 hours a day. And you know, that's a few months down the road. Maybe later I can help. He said, we've well, got two classmates on that wall, Tommy Denning and Larry Fogel. He said, we have to do it to honor them. So I went upstairs and talked to the plant manager and uh, I told him what was going on. I said, you know, some days when I'm here, if it's kind of quiet, uh, slip over to a meeting or you know, go help out. Like he said, do whatever you, you, you need to do. He said, that's really important. So I got to working with Dave, and that's when I got to meet Sammy Davis, uh, the Medal of Honor recipient. Sammy came in for the, the moving wall, and then later came back for the dedication of the War Memorial of the Common Man, the Tribute Tower on the River, and he's been to Rising Sun Schools with me in Lawrenceburg and Green Day on St. Lawrence. And, uh, really a great guy, great American. When I came home from Vietnam, I took my uniform off, went back to work at Sagram's, went on with my life. Eventually wound up here in Rising Sun, got married, had kids, grandkids, and your life just becomes really, really busy. And uh, I joined, they had a dinner for us at the VFW in Aurora in November of 68. I think it was seven of us. They had a good story on us in the paper and had a supper and gave us a free membership to the VFW. Well, I went to a few meetings and then eventually joined uh, the American Legion. The Vietnam veterans join them and organizations, but you get busy and some of this stuff gets pushed back on the back burner. So I really didn't have time to go to the meetings and do things until 2009, after that, when I retired from INM. And that gave me the time to be active in the, the color guard for the Rising Sun Legion post 59. And then in 2010, when I took 50, Korean War veterans, they asked me to be an associate member of their group and then their color guard. And you were with me yesterday when we did one of our details. guys I said it's important that you do this stuff and remember if you don't then it, it's all in vain I said 
when somebody passes away and they're a veteran, they deserve to have a flag draped coffin. They deserve to have military rights where you fold the flag off of the coffin, present it to the family, firing of the three volleys with the rifles and the playing of taps. And one of the, the things that I, I was kind of proud of when I was doing these stories for the, eventually it wound up to be 50 from Dearborn, Ohio, Switzerland, Ripley and Franklin counties that were killed in Vietnam. The mom and dad lived at uh, Hamilton, Ohio. So I called them and told them what I was doing. They were a little apprehensive at first, skeptical. And I said, I'm, you know, I'm legitimate. I'm not trying to make a dime off of this. And we're gonna have the moving wall come in. And, and so I went up and visited them. And the dad, Elmer, had had a stroke and he was limited movement on his left side. Real nice man and his wife. And uh, got to talking to her. And uh, so then she started getting this stuff out and showing it to me in pictures. And her son's name was Davy, David Schneider, David Allen Schneider. And he's buried at Brookville because she was originally from Brookville. So I told Paul, I said, I'll be up there for, you know, 15, 20, 30 minutes. Well, I was there about three hours with him. And uh, I said, if you'll trust me with this stuff, I'm going to take it to a CVS and I'm going to make copies of this stuff in my records and I'll bring it back. So it was three or four days later when I got back and I called her. I said, I'll be there in about 20 minutes. And I stopped at the memorial at the edge of uh, Hamilton and they had his name on that memorial there. And so I came up, knocked on the door and she came to the door and she was crying. She said, come on in, I want, I want to show you what you did. And I thought, oh no, what have I done? I you know, stirred up a can of worms, back up all these memories for this woman. And she had told me the story of when Davy was killed, that she was having these terrible dreams. And she said, I told Elmer, her name was Ruth. And uh, Ruth said, I told Elmer, Davy's bleeding from the head. And she said, I ripped the sheets up and took my sweater off and everything and tried to stop that bleeding. She said, I can't stop that bleeding. And he said, well, you need to go down and talk to the priest. And you gotta, you're gonna be a nervous wreck and you're gonna drive yourself nuts. So about two days later, came that knock at the door. And she went to the door and there was two army officers there. And she said, oh my God, my son's Davy's dead. And he's been shot in the head. And so they had this shocked look and they said, did somebody already call you and talk to you? And she said, no, I've been having these dreams. And they said, well, your son David was killed in action in Vietnam, he's 18 years old from a head wound, gunshot wound to the head. And, uh, so when I went, she said, I want to show you what you did. And so I came in, she had these albums out on a big coffee table. She had, he said, she's about to drive me nuts again. So she stayed up all night working on this stuff. And all of his letters, she put in those albums, all of his pictures. She said, no longer will this stuff just be stuck back in a closet. It's going to be out here where people can see it. I'm proud of my son. But uh, got to meet a lot of, a lot of nice people through that and uh, you know for most of them it's it's like it was last week or a month ago not it was 30 or 40 or now 50 years ago it's still still there in the back of their minds just like it happened and uh, we had our class reunion last night and I put on Facebook today that we had I had my memorial there the big picture frame with Tommy Dennings and Larry Fogel's information in it and uh, I said uh, Tommy's always going to be 19 years old we're all great headed and getting old and Tommy's 19 and Larry's still 18. They're 18 and 19 years old and be, be that way forever. This uniform here, I decorated in honor of one of my classmates, Larry Dale Fogel. Uh, Larry grew up in Lawrenceburg and he was the first one from Durban County killed in action in Vietnam. And uh, Two years ago, I was given the Veterans Day speech at South Dibburn Elementary School, and I knew Larry's sister was gonna be there, and his sister's daughter, and then her little boy, so three generations of the Fogel family. And I surprised them, and I had this uniform covered up next to the podium where I was speaking. And I said, she was only six years old when Larry was killed. I said, I've got something that uh, I wanna show you. I decorated in honor of Larry dress greens and you see it has the uh, blue infantry rope and it has 
his PFC stripe on it, his presidential unit citation, uh, meritorious unit in Vietnam, uh, unit citation, Fogel, his infantry, U.S. and infantry cross rifles with the blue disc in the background, his CIB combat improvements badge, and then his airborne wings. See over here, he was 173rd Airborne. And uh, he was awarded two Purple Hearts in Vietnam. That's a Purple Heart, uh, represents the Purple Heart Medal with an oak leaf cluster showing a, a subsequent award. And then his Bronze Star with V for Valor. Um, his shooting badges. But uh, Larry was born December the 16th, 1947. He was in my class, but really he should have been a year behind being that birthday that late in the year. And wound up there were about 12 or 13 kids in that family. And Larry, when we were juniors in high school, he, he wanted to go into the Army. He wanted to make a career out of it. So he talked his mom and dad into signing for him to drop out of school and, and go to the Army. And he said besides, he would be making some money and he could send money home to him. And uh, that was another thing. We found some letters last year when I gave the speech at uh, South Dibburn Elementary School. I had those letters and his sister had never read a letter that Larry had written from Vietnam. So I made copies of them and presented them to her. And we're gonna frame the, the others and preserve them. But uh, Larry went to Vietnam and he was wounded when he was only 17 years old. And uh, they had a controversy back here in the United States and they said that's too young to be in combat, so they pulled him out. And on December 16th, 1965, Larry turned 18. He said, hey, I can go back out with the guys. And when you read some of his letters, they were going up into the area in 65 and opening up, up around Coochie where I eventually went. They were going on missions up through there and sweeps. And he was talking about, you know, losing some of his buddies and some of them being wounded and, and all. But he went back out in the field with his uh, unit and four days later on December the 20th, 1965, Larry Fogel was killed in action. And a lot of times when I give speeches at schools, I'll ask the high school kids, I'll say, how many of you students in attendance here today are older than 18 years and four months? And there are several hands that go up. So you realize really how young he was. But we never, never forget him. Anytime I, I do a program, I always talk about Larry. And and when we did his mom's funeral, she was in a nursing home with Grandpa Peely. And I used to stop and see her, and uh, she wouldn't say Larry. Larry did this or Larry did that. It was always my boy, my boy. My boy, you knew my boy, you liked my boy. My boy did this, my boy was in the army, my boy was killed. The letters there where he, he told his mom, he said, go to the uh, American State Bank and borrow $300 for Christmas. He said, I want the kids to have a, a good Christmas. And this was Christmas of 65, right? And he was killed five days before Christmas. And he said, people at the bank know me and they know I'm in the Army, and he said, tell them I'll send them $100 a month for three months to repay it, but I want you guys to have a good Christmas. And then jokingly, he said, besides, he said, if I get killed, you're gonna get $10,000. And it was just a couple weeks later that he was killed. And uh, he just wanted to have a better life for the kids. So when she died, I brought the Patriot Guard and the Color Guard out because she was a Gold Star mother. And at Riverview Cemetery, we fired the three volleys with the rifles, played taps for her, and, and folded the flag, presented it to the family. And uh, <clears throat> last year, on Veterans Day, the year before is when I did the uniform, and, and then I called a Navy or a Navy recruiter up, and a guy who was a helicopter pilot was at South Dibburn, and I brought a burial flag, and I said, Terry, you were too young to remember and participate in Larry. I said, but we're gonna honor him with a burial flag here today and show these kids what we do when uh, a veteran passes away. And so I folded the flag with the help of those two guys and then I took the microphone and I said on behalf of the United, on behalf of the President of the United States, the Secretary of the Army and a grateful nation, 
please accept this American flag as a token of appreciation for the faithful and dedicated service of your brother Larry. It's because of young men like him who answered the call to serve that we're able to enjoy the many freedoms we have today in the USA. As a proud Vietnam veteran and a member of the 173rd Airborne, he gave his life in Vietnam so that we can enjoy the lifestyle we have today. He truly understood the meaning of those words, duty, honor, country. May God bless you, your family, and the United States of America. And because of young men like Larry Dale Fogle, we can all continue to live the American dream. May he rest in eternal peace. And I presented that American flag to her and her daughter and uh, Terry's little grandson. This first uniform, this is a World War II uniform. It belongs to a guy named Albert Carl Weimar. He was from Aurora, Indiana. And this uniform was stored at the VFW Hall in Aurora for several years. The family had donated it after his death. Somebody found it and contacted me, and I finished decorating it. And uh, it had his big red one patch on it, and his stripes, his ruptured duck, his brass, his uh, cord, his overseas bars, and uh, his medic badge. But uh, I put the weapons qualifications, the expert for the rifle and a uh, sharpshooter for a rifle on it, along with the ribbons designating the medals that he received. And the presidential unit citation, meritorious unit citation, and his name tag. It had a meritorious unit sewn on here. It also had the ruptured duck sewn on it. And then the ruptured duck, which is the honorable discharge pin from World War II, I put that on there. But if you look up here in the corner, that is a silver star. And a silver star is the third highest award you can receive for valor. Medal of Honor being the first one. If you're in the Army, the Distinguished Service Cross, the Navy or Marine Corps, the Navy Cross and then the Silver Star is the third highest one you can get. So he was awarded, uh, I'm gonna to try to find a, a copy of the citation. I've got the number of it. I can look on the Home of Heroes website and probably get the citation telling exactly what he did. But I imagine being a medic, he was out in the, in the field and, and working on guys under enemy fire. But uh, I know his son and I talked to his son about it. His son didn't even realize that he'd received a silver star in World War II. He said he knew he had received some medals, but he didn't realize that he'd received that high of a valor award. But I like those, what they call the Eisenhower jackets, the short, the short jackets, those are, those are the neat ones. The one next to it's another World War II veteran that I'm working on. I've got to get the tie for it. I've got all of his information. In fact, I did an interview with him, uh, Carol Scudder. He's 95 years old now. Still, he's in a nursing home down in Switzerland County, but I have to get his ribbons and everything and finish decorating it up and uh, his brass for his uh, collar. And so that's, that's a work in progress. And this next one is just an Army field jacket. It belonged to a guy named Walt Bryant. And uh, Walt Bryant was a, an E-8. He retired from the Army. Combat after his badge, his airborne wings, and of course, U.S. Army. And uh, Walt was, did two tours in Vietnam, received two Purple Hearts. One Purple Heart was from shrapnel wounds, and the other Purple Heart he received was for a bayonet through the foot. Didn't take much to figure that out. They were being overran, and he was in hand-to-hand -hand combat with a Viet Cong soldier, or a couple of them. And uh, the one guy swung at him with a bayonet, stabbed him through the foot, well, and one of his buddies killed the, the Viet Cong that had stabbed him, and then he, Walt wound up killing the guy that who uh, he was fighting with. But I've got some uh, other things downstairs I'll show you that Walt donated. There's a picture of me in a gun jeep in Vietnam. That was our M60 machine gun mounted on a stand with a swivel, swivel 360 degrees. Of course, you always, when you went into a village or someplace, the little kids were always around looking for something. And then this uniform in the corner 
belongs to a, a dust-off pilot. Dust-off pilots in Vietnam flew the helicopters, went into the uh, hot LZs and rescued the wounded, wounded soldiers. And uh, this Gary Doolittle, that's his flight suit and his dress uniform over there. He was also a Purple Heart and Silver Star recipient. Unfortunately, he was shot down and killed on one of his rescue missions. He had picked up some wounded soldiers and uh, gave his life saving others. His brother lives out here uh, on Bascom Corner Road in Ohio County. And uh, he called me when we brought the moving wall to Rising Sun in 2008, wanting to know if he could leave something at the wall. And I said, sure, that's what it's for. And uh, I said, where'd you go to school? He said, Colerain Col High School. I said, well, yeah. He said, I, my brother's on the wall. And uh, he said, but I live in Rising Sun. I live on Bascom Corner Road. I said, what? I said, that's only a mile or so from the crow flies from where I live. Come to find out he'd been to our house. His daughter played softball for Kelly and came over there and practiced softball. And, but you can see here, he gave me the uniform and it didn't have anything on it, it was just plain. I put the warrant officer bars on it, the US for the officer, his flight wings and uh, name tag badges, Silver Star, Purple Heart, and the other awards that he got. But, uh, this guy was in the Coast Guard for four years and he wanted to fly and they said, you have a lot better chance if you go to the Army and go to flight school. So he got out of the Coast Guard, went to the Army and became a helicopter pilot. And then behind me, this is my grandfather, who was Spanish-American War veteran. That's a 48-star flag. He died three years before I was born. It says, Charles Andrew Gentrop, Spanish-American War, uh, Company F, 159th Indiana Infantry, uh, February 23rd, 1879, he died March the 3rd, 1944. So he died about three years and three months before I was even born. But that's his burial flag that covered his casket, the 48 star flag. And his dad, his dad was the Civil War veteran. Um, This table here is, uh, this really, this is kind of a sad table. Got some books about the Civil War, but I always hate it when I go a place like uh, Cracker Barrel and they have these pictures hanging up of soldiers and family members. Those, that's somebody's mom, dad, grandpa, great grandparents, or, you know. Some, but there's no writing on these, and all three of these came from the persimmon tree down here at Rising Sun. And uh, I thought, just can't let them go out and be lost. That's a World War I doughboy in there, and we've taken them apart and looked every place, and there's no name, nothing to identify them. And there's another one, it's in color, a World War I doughboy. And then this one here is a Civil War veteran. And I wrote on this, I got a picture of the Tomb of the Unknowns in Washington. This section is dedicated to those in these photos who are unknown, just like those who are buried at the Tomb of the Unknowns at Arlington National Cemetery. For whatever reasons, no name was put with these photos and now they rest someplace known only to God. May God bless them and may they rest in eternal peace. They may be unknown, but they are known and respected in our hearts. Uh, it would, uh, each one of those guys has a, a story to tell, but unfortunately, uh, unless somebody comes in here and says, oh my gosh, I know who that is. Hard telling where they're from, who they are, where they served, what they did. But, uh, at least we got a picture of them. This display here is dedicated to Captain Bill McClure, old Captain Bill was quite a character. Uh, his full name was William Morton McClure. 
He was born January 27th, 1920, and he passed away earlier this year, January the 5th, 2015. And almost 95 years, and I don't think Captain Bill ever met a stranger. Uh, <laughs> he was so funny to be around. Uh, he went a lot of places with me, a lot of schools, on my trips to D.C., uh, Memorial Day events, Veterans Day events. Uh, he, he was always on, always on the go, and every place you went, even if it was the skyline to eat where he liked to go, you couldn't go in there for 20 or 30 minutes. It was going to be two, two and a half hours because as soon as he walked through the door, he'd walk over, and a lot of times he'd draw attention because he'd wear his World War II uniform. He could still fit into that uniform that he wore in, uh, back in World War II. He could still fit up to the day he died. He could still fit in that uniform. And so he, he just drew attention. And he'd walk in and say, hey, I'm Bill McClure. I'm from Rising Sun. Where are you people from? They might be from Lawrenceburg, or they might be traveling through from someplace. I remember one day he sat and talked to some people from Virginia for about an hour. And uh, that's just the type, type of guy he was. He served in the South Pacific down in the Philippine Islands, and his claim to fame was at the end of World War II, they built uh, a hospital there at, uh, with the prisoners of war, Japanese, and they had to get it up in 10 days and had it up and running so they could uh, be working on people. But he uh, got to meet General Yamashita. General Yamashita was the number two general in the Japanese army who eventually was hanged for his war crimes. But he and Captain Bill, well, there for about six months, became pretty good friends. He said General Yamashita could speak seven languages. He said, heck, he said he could speak English better than I could. But uh, it really bothered him when, uh, when uh, they put the rope around Yamashita's neck. But anyway, that's his World War II uniform. And for years, he wore it to functions and didn't have anything on it. And I said, Captain, we need to decorate that uniform up. But he had, uh, he was going to Purdue University where he was on the boxing team. And he had completed his junior year and his first semester, he needed one more semester to uh, graduate. And World War II broke out and they said, uh, they said, well, you can stay and finish school. He was in ROTC or you can go get commissioned. He said, well, I want to go ahead and be commissioned. He said, I'll finish my education when I get back. He said, if we don't have a country, what goods and education going to do me? So with only one semester to go at Purdue, he volunteered and uh, he was at the Pentagon for a while in Washington, D.C. and then he got sent to the Philippines. And uh, after that, he, he came home and he was, uh, uh, feed salesman and a school teacher and eventually owned the uh, Humphrey uh, McClure Funeral Home here in Rising Sun for several years, but uh, helped form the Rising Sun Ohio County Life Squad. He was one of the charter members of that and got it going. But quite a, quite a co colorful character. And uh, there's uh, the article they had on the front page of the paper here. Colorful Captain Bill heads home right after his, his death. But there's so many people in there in these photos. It's just how many people's lives that he touched. But I, I can look at each picture on these and I can tell you, you know, where it is and what we were doing. And here's one, uh, we were up at uh, Lebanon, Ohio. And this is a, a um, Major General, Mark Milley and Brett Von Durant was with us. There was a young man named Bobby Estel who was killed in uh, Afghanistan. And uh, Brett, Captain Bill, and I went up there for the funeral. And uh, General Milley came up to me at the cemetery. He said, hey, so I noticed uh, you guys did the walkthrough there at the end and you know saluted Bobby Estel. He said, the young man with you was in the, the fatigues uh, he said he, he's wearing a purple heart. He said he, he was limping. I said, well, Brett Von Dern, he lost both legs in Afghanistan. He said, do you think he'd talk to me? I said, yeah. So I walked over to Brett and I said, hey, General Milley wants to speak with you. And I thought, here's a, a two-star general, a major general. He's got his 
entourage with him, three or four guys, and, and I know they're chomping at the bit. He was with the 10th Mountain Division, had to fly back to New York. And they said, we've got a plane waiting on us. And, and he said, that plane will wait. And I thought he'd go over to Brett and say, you know, thank you for your service. I'd have been proud of you to have been in my unit. But he took him off to the side and they talked for a good 15 minutes. Now a general just doesn't talk to a PFC for 15 minutes. I thought, this guy here is special. So I got a picture of him uh, with Captain Bill and I got a picture of him with Brett and when Dave Tiki was with us too. And General Milley, the next time I heard of him, he was a three-star general, which is a lieutenant general. And it's when they had the shootings at Fort Hood. He was in charge of Fort Hood. Well, I went out to um, uh, Camp Atterbury with Mike LaFollette one day to watch him fire the howitzers and everything on the ranges out there. And there was a, a, a general out there, and he had a 10th Mountain Division patch on. And I said, 10th Mountain Division? He said, yeah. I said, uh, I said you know, General, um, did you know when I knew him, Major General Mark Milley, now he's a Lieutenant General. He goes, no, he's a four-star general now. He's a full general. I said, what? I said, boy, he moved up fast. He said, yeah. He said, he's a four-star and he's in charge of 750,000 troops out of some, you know how they have all the initials, out of Fort Bragg, North Carolina. He said, he's a four-star general. So I want to get a hold of General Milley and send that picture of Captain Bill to him, tell him, you know, World War II veteran has passed on, but would you sign the picture for Brett? Brett's doing well and tell him how, how far he's come along. But there's not too many World War II veterans left here in Ohio County. And I was trying to figure up the other day and uh, everyone I think of, they're not really getting out and about anymore. Uh, Bob Horton's above town here. I haven't seen him for a while. Um, Lionel Turner's in the nursing home down here. Kenny Swanson's in the nursing home down here. Bill Welder lived down there across from the nursing home, and I haven't seen Bill for a few years. He went to Washington with me on one of my honor flights. Uh, old uh, uh, Charlie McCardle, he lives out in the country, and I haven't seen Charlie for quite a while. He went on an honor flight with me, but there's just, just not too many of them. At one time, there were 16 and a half million World War II veterans. And today there's maybe between seven and eight, seven and 800,000. And there for a while they were dying about 1,100 a day, but the numbers are getting down now that are still dying 500, 550 a day, they estimate. Last year I wanted to get a banner made and I had uh, Paul Ivey, he was still alive and he was there in his uniform. Bill Rowling was there, Captain Bill was there in his uniform. In just that year's time, we, we lost all those. The Korean boys aren't too far behind because World War II ended in 1945 and Korea broke out in 50, so there's only a five year spread. Some of those guys were World War II and Korean War veterans. This guy here, Arthur Turner, he's a World War II veteran. He had came home in 1945 and put that uniform in a trunk. And about five years ago, his nephew, well, actually his niece, guy she's married to worked with me at INM. He called me up and he said, hey, Uncle Arthur's got a uniform. He didn't know what to do with it. Nobody wants it. So I went out to his house and interviewed him and got it. And he said, man, he said, I like what you've done to it. He said, when I die, he said, you bring that to the funeral home, put that up in my casket and have it on display. And so a few years later, I did. I took it to Dillsboro, had it on display at his funeral. And then my classmate I grew up with, Dave Tiki, I did this uniform for Dave. Vietnam veteran, and uh, he's got all his paraphernalia on it. He's, Dave's seen a picture of it, but he hasn't actually been down here to see the uniform yet. He had a stroke last year. In fact, I took him to the reunion last night. Mom and I picked him up and got him in his wheelchair and took him up there so he can go to the dinner. So that's Vietnam. And then this one here, Charles Clinton, Chalky Fleek. And if you look right here, Medal of Honor. Chalky's 25th Infantry Division, Sergeant. And uh, first of the 27th Wolfhounds. He was airborne. And 
It was in May of 1968. They were on patrol and they had a big uh, firefight with some uh, Viet Cong. And the Viet Cong, you know, they killed several of them. They were scattered and they were trying to move down the road and regroup. And Chalky and his guys moved on down. They set up an ambush on them. And uh, they got into another firefight with them and they threw a grenade in and Chalky tried to, at first they said he dove on the grenade, but he tried to scoop it up with his helmet and get rid of it. And as he did, it went off and uh, killed him. So he was, his family was posthumously awarded the uh, Medal of Honor at the White House by President Nixon. And I know his brother Sonny real well. And when I decorated that uniform, I put it on display at the Art Guild in Aurora when they were bringing the LST 325 in. And I called Sonny and I said, hey, I got Chalky's uniform done. He said, where is it? I said, down here in Aurora. You come down this weekend for the LS 325. You can see it and get pictures of it. He said, I'll be right down. So he and his wife came right down. And Sonny eventually went to Washington, D.C. with me to see his name on the wall. And his Medal of Honor is on display across the river. At, uh, he grew up in Petersburg, Kentucky but it's up at Hebron, Kentucky at the government building. They've got it up there behind a bulletproof glass and it's uh, a nice display. Uh, I've got some pictures of it someplace I need to put with that. And I got cigar boxes around that uh, when I need stuff. I keep patches in them and ribbons and buttons and A lot of it comes in handy to, when you're decorating a uniform. Uh, these are for Bill Rawling, R-O-W-L-I-N-G. Uh, these are some frames that I made up for Bill and had on display at his funeral. Bill Rawling was a uh, prisoner of war in World War II. He uh, went in, he was 19 years old and went through training and became a uh, a belly gunner on a B-17 aircraft. And so I did these frames and there's one over there and had these on display at Bill's, Bill's funeral. Last September, he was one of my wreath presenters at the Tomb of the Unknowns. Three of the four wreath presenters on that trip in September were World War II veterans, Bill Rawling, Bush White, and Tom Hughes, Ronnie Harrell's father-in-law. Uh, it's kind of unusual that late in the game to have three, three out of four reef presenters from World War II veterans. And there they are at the Tomb of the Unknowns. Uh, Bill walked into my office one day a few years ago and he said, my name's Bill Rawling, I'm an ex-POW. And I looked at him and I said, Korea? He goes, no, World War II. At that time he was like 88 years old. I said, well, you sure don't look it. And uh, he said, I spent 15 months in a German prisoner of war camp, shot down in a B-17. Two of the crew, 10 member crew were killed. And he parachuted to safety and tried to elude the German forces. Eventually they captured the eight survivors, kept them all split up. They didn't know who survived till after the war was over. And uh, so he, he just sat down there and talked and about an hour and a half in my office, and then I said, you know, I'd love to talk to you some more. I said, can you come back for lunch tomorrow? I said, I got to run to Aurora and pick uh, my twin grandkids up from school. And they were in uh, preschool then. And he said, yeah. So he came back the next day and I got Captain Bill. And we went down, we sat down to the Legion for about three and a half hours and just talked about his life. And later on, I presented him with a uh, a Purple Heart plaque at Fall Fest in Lawrenceburg last year on stage with Daryl Worley. And Daryl Worley dedicated a song to him uh, that he had written. And so we had a real good time. Then we gave him a Purple Heart plaque here at Rising Sun at the Bean Festival. Got him uh, a quilt of valor, presented that to him. He got to go to Lunkin Airport it was uh, last year when we went to the Smoky Mountains. The, I got a phone call, got him set up on a flight to fly on a B-17 that was coming into Lunkin Airport. 
they were charging $450 for the flights, but they said he's a prisoner of war and was shot down in one. He gets a free flight. So he, he really enjoyed it. I said, you know, 70 years ago, you were shot down in a B-17. You got to take off. And uh, now 70 years later, you're gonna finally get to land. I said, that's a long flight, 70 years. He said, yeah. He said, I hope I get to land, don't have to parachute again. But there was a story, and I gotta find this story. When he landed, he ditched his parachute and it had his name, William J. Rowling, stitched in it. Somebody later found that silk parachute and they made it into a wedding dress for their daughter. But uh, just a super nice guy. And, and his daughter even said to me, she goes, I got a question for you. She says, how did you get my dad to talk? She said, my dad never talked about that to anybody but me and Stoney. I said, he just walked in one day and sat down and started talking. I said, I guess he figured it was the point of his life that he wanted to get some things off of his chest and talk about them. And I said, I took him to the Dearborn Adult Center in Lawrenceburg and uh, the uh, senator's office, one of our two U.S. senators, sent a film crew down to interview World War II veterans. And I took Captain Bill up, Bush White, and Bill Rawling. And Bill was in there and told his story for 30 minutes, and Bush was in there for 30 minutes. And Captain Bill was in there, and Marie Edwards said to me, she said, how long has Captain Bill been in there? I said, ooh, about 45 minutes. I said, he's probably going a little over. So then after an hour, I said, you think he's all right? I said, yeah, he's fine. So about an hour and a half, he came out, and that lady, she said, I've never had anybody talk like this man. She said, uh, <laughs> So he's in there for an hour and a half and just talking. <laughs> he's a big Reds fan. And that was another honor we got him, took him to Cincinnati Reds game, and he was honored as the hometown hero one day. He got up on the dugout and had all the people. I said, when's the last time you had 38,000 people on their feet give you a standing ovation? He said, never happened. I jumped, I jumped up on the dugout to help him get up there. And then he said, you're gonna stay up here with me, aren't you? I said, nope, this is your show, buddy. So I jumped back down. I said, I'll hold your feet so you know you're not going to fall off of the, the dugout. So he turned around and, and uh, big, big honor for him. You got to jump back up a little later. I got to jump back up, yeah, about a month later I got to do it. And uh, that's what I was thinking about when I was up there. Kind of, you know, Bill was up here and, and, and what he got to do. And then there's one here that I did for Jackie Myers. I've been working for years on the, the ones from southeastern Indiana, Dearborn, Ohio, Switzerland, Ripley, and Franklin counties that were killed in Vietnam and thought I was finished. And Glenn Wright uh, called me one day and he said, hey, you ever heard of a guy named Jackie Myers? I said, no. He said, well, he's buried out at East Enterprise. I said, yeah. He said he was killed in Vietnam. I said, no way. I said, five miles from my house, and there's a kid that's buried there that was killed in Vietnam, and I don't know about him. I said, I don't know how that'd be possible. He said, well, I was out to Scottsburg, Indiana, and picked up one of these books and was thumbing through it about the ones that were killed in Vietnam, and it says uh, Jackie uh, Myers is uh, buried at East Enterprise. I said, well, I'm going to go find out. So I got in a car, and I drove down and went out there, and I found his grave site. And there's pictures of it on here. And uh, it's right there across from the church. William, William Henry Myers. They called him Jackie or Chico. And so then Captain Bill and I drove out to, it was not Scottsburg, Salem, Indiana. We drove out there one day and I found the information and uh, Come to find out he was awarded the Navy Cross. So he was probably put in for the Medal of Honor, but they downgraded it to the second highest award, the Navy Cross. And so then I got to checking more and more and trying to find relatives and reading them. And uh, finally I saw the name Voris in there, V-O-R-I-S, because he had, and it turned out to be a really a tragic story. Uh, he and his brother, Eddie, and their mom and dad, they traveled like the fair circuit in the south, Alabama, Florida, Georgia. And they'd go one week after another, they'd go to these fairs and set up. Well, 
the mom died or the dad died and then a year or so later the mom died. Mom was buried in Florida and the dad in Georgia. So these two boys were orphans. So they were going to go to an orphanage. And uh, this lady here, it's in the picture right here. She's um, Mrs. Alberta Voris, V-O-R-I-S. She was a cousin living here in Indiana. And she said, no, I'll go get the boys. She, she went to Georgia and got them and brought them back here, <laughs> raising them. Uh, it was New Year's Eve of uh, 1964, and Chico, or Jackie, and his brother Eddie were hunting along the railroad tracks out of Salem, Indiana, hunting rabbits. And Jackie had just killed a rabbit, went and picked it up, and he handed the shotgun to Eddie, who was 16 years old. He said, now it's ready to shoot. It's your turn to shoot one. And they went walking on down the tracks, and they came to this trestle. He started to climb up, and Eddie put that shotgun down and took his foot and went step up, hit the trigger, and killed himself. And so he's dead. So here's the mom's dead, the dad's dead. One's buried in Georgia, one in Florida. Eddie's dead. Chico's the only one left. So he goes and joins the Marine Corps as soon as he gets out of high school. Goes to Vietnam, he gets killed. And so mom and dad are buried away from here. They're buried side by side at East Enterprise forgotten but it's just uh you know talk about bad luck they they didn't have anything grew up dirt poor traveling the fair circuit and then everybody winds up dead and then there's grandpa peewee's story was in the paper and articles and things about his funeral procession we had the case on the picture with the case on in front of the courthouse when he was going by to the cemetery now this display here is for a good friend of mine, Luther Rice. Uh, there's a picture frame back there, United States Marine Corps. Uh, Luther served uh, 23 years in the United States Marine Corps. He graduated, he was 17 years old and graduated in May of 1948 and didn't turn 18 until December the 31st of 48. He was had already been in the Marine Corps for six months when he turned uh, 18 years old. He was another one of those that started school a year early, should have been a year behind. But uh, Luther was a longtime commander of the Korean War Veterans, Chapter 4 in Aurora, Indiana, and built that up from the ground uh, to what it is today. But Luther uh, was diagnosed last year with ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Lou Gehrig's disease, and uh, it's like he said, the only consolation was that he was uh, 83 years old when he was diagnosed with it. But he said, I've lived a, a full life. I've done about what I want to. So he wound up in Ridgewood Nursing Home in uh, Lawrenceburg. And it was back in October of last year. We had been taking him to VA Hospital in Cincinnati for a few months for these infusions, thinking it was peripheral neuropathy and they weren't doing any good. He was getting weaker by the day, he could feel it. So he wound up, we took him to Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, they put him through four and a half hours of testing up there, the shock treatments and everything. And this young lady doctor, she said, I've developed a lot of these tests. I'm one of the experts on you know, ALS and peripheral neuropathy and stuff like that. She said, you will have a confirmed diagnosis when you leave here today. And she said, I've got reviewed all my tests. She said, I'm ready to make my diagnosis. And she, I still got the picture. She drew a picture of the brain and the spinal cord. She said, if this was your sensory neurons, those infusions would be working. You would show improvement. She said, but unfortunately, it's your motor neurons and there's no cure for that. And Luther reached out and patted her on the knee and he said, honey, he said, it's okay. He said, you can tell me I have ALS. She said, yes, sir, you do. He said, well, you just gave me my death sentence. And we were there with him when he took his last breath. But he gave me his dress blues. He said, I want you to put those down there on display. And so I told him, I said, well, I'm going to put them on a half mannequin like this. And then I'm just going to have the hat on display on the side. 
He said, well, if I've got any say-so in this, he said, I want a full man mannequin with a head, and I want it to be 6'2", because that's lifelike for me. So I, I found one, I know it was $150, $60 for the mannequin. So I sent and got it and decorated it up, and, and I took pictures of it, had him hanging on the locker uh, in his room up there. And he got to come down and see it and his family. And he said, oh, he said, I like it. I really like it. And then I took it up when we had his funeral at the Baptist church up there on the hill in Aurora. I had all the frames of the pictures and all the memorabilia. And I took the uniform, had it sitting up there by the casket. And I think he'd have been happy. And we used the same case on for his funeral that we did for Grandpa Curry's. And it came from the church out on the hill, down through Aurora, went to Lesco Park. And uh, Jerry and I were two of the pole bearers, and we unloaded it and put it on the case on Lesco Park, and then they trotted down to Riverview Cemetery. And then we had the funeral, and we had the color guard. We had 40, 42 people in the color guard that day. And those were the ribbons that were on his flowers at the gravesite, dad, husband, and grandpa. So I went back up. Uh, the flowers were dried up and all, and I took those off and, and saved those. And I've got pictures of the funeral and when uh, mom took pictures for me and so I'll have another frame that big of stuff you know, for Luther. But he had, uh, everything was on here, except he had a 12 bar on here. There was two awards that he had that weren't on there, so I sent and got a 14 bar and put all of them on it and then added the two to it, but otherwise it was the way he had it. This is a World War I Doughboy jacket and a World War I Doughboy steel pot. And there's an army blanket. Well, that, that's pretty neat, World War I Doughboy. That steel pot's neat too, Doughboy hat. And then this is Brett. Brett actually wore these, this BDU, and uh, he wore this when we went to Washington, D.C. with the Purple Heart on it. That's the uniform he had on. We were at the White House, and I gave him a speech on the bus before we got off. I said, we're going in on the Lafayette Park side, Pennsylvania Avenue. That's where the protesters are. Just ignore them. They're, they're out there to try to make a name for themselves. So we were up there getting pictures, and this old timer walked up and he had a sign in each hand, probably mid to upper 70s, real frail looking. And uh, so I'm taking a picture of Brett and, and uh, Grandpa Jerry, and we're talking. And he goes, Hey, he goes, are you a veteran? I just looked at him, kind of turned my back to him, and was talking to them. He comes around, and he goes, Hey, he said, I asked you a question. He said, Are you a veteran? And I said, Can you read my shirt? It says Indiana. I'm from the state of Indiana veteran means that I'm a veteran, honorably discharged veteran. He goes, well, if you're a veteran, you're a coward. And I just looked at him and grinned. Of course, the Capitol Police are standing there to protect him. And I said, you know what? I said, you're lucky that you live in the United States of America. I said, you're not stupid enough to realize that if you did this in another country, you would have already disappeared. Nobody would care where you were. They'd never find you. I said, this young man right here wears this purple heart because he walks with legs in Afghanistan giving you the right to protest, so you should appreciate that. He goes, you lost both legs in Afghanistan? I said, yes, sir, I did. He goes, well, you're a coward, too. And I just kind of stuck my hand on Brett. I said, Brett, remember what I told you? And by this time, people were crowding around. And uh, I said, sir, I said, I'm going to tell you something. I said, uh, there is no way in hell that you can ever come up to the level of the United States veteran, and there's no way one will ever come down to your level. I said, we're getting ready to go to Arlington National Cemetery when we leave here, present a wreath at the Tomb of the Unknowns. I said, we would take you with us and drop you off in the Potomac, but they would arrest us for polluting the river. I said, so you have a nice day. Enjoy your freedoms that we have all given and protected for you. And uh, some guy stepped out when he was with us, he said, he said, you're disrespectful. He said, I just ought to knock you on your butt. And the guy goes, he goes, look at me. He says, I'm old and feeble and you want to hit me. I said, sir, 
it's not your body that's feeble, it's your mind that's feeble. <laughs> I said, you have a good day, and, and uh, one of the uh, Capitol Police officers, he looked at me, grinned and winked, and gave me a thumbs up. And I said, we're, we're not here to argue with you, there's no arguing with stupidity. And then Jerry Von Durant, Brett's grandpa, this is his 101st Airborne. I've been working on it. I just got the 101st Airborne patch put on his PFC stripes, his uh, blue disc and infantry, infantry rope, Von Durant, shooting badges, the one ribbon he got, National Defense, and his airborne wings. Um, of course, these three uniforms, this is Mickey's Air Force uniform. His original was eight up, and when uh, Cindy, the lady, gave me those uniforms over there, there were two Air Force ones, so I took the stripes and uh, put new stripes on it, got the ribbons, his name tag, and I used his old brass. But, uh, so that, that's Uncle Mickey's, and there's a picture of him down there. Mickey Curry, U.S. Air Force, Vietnam. Thailand. This is Grandpa Curry's that we decorated for him. Got the meritorious unit citation on the sleeve, sergeant stripes, name tag, presidential unit citation, ruptured duck, ruptured duck pin, that's the honorable discharge for World War II, his U.S. and uh, Chemical Corps brass, his ribbons, uh, he's got the uh, EAME, European, African, Middle Eastern medal, World War II victory, occupation of Germany, uh, American defense, and uh, the Army good conduct. And then there's his overseas fogey, or his three years. Uh, really should add his, he was over there two years, he should have four bars over here. I'll get to that, and that was one of his World War II hats and then there's my uniform the only time I had it on when I went overseas to Vietnam in late August of 1967 they took my dress greens away from me I flew the Pacific in khakis khaki uniform they didn't have any use for dress greens in Vietnam so when I flew back to the States when I went on R&R &R, and when I flew back to the States I flew in khakis and uh, when I got back to San Francisco and, and Oakland, they fitted me for a brand new uniform, put my 25th Entry Division patch, Spec 4 patch, my ribbons, shooting badges, name tag, and uh, the citations on it, unit citations. And I flew home and flew from San Francisco to Chicago, Chicago to Indianapolis, went up to Cayuga with Anthony Kerm, took it off, and it's the only time I ever had it on. I thought, what a waste. They gave me a brand new pair of shoes and a shirt and a tie and, and a uniform just to fly home in and a hat. And that was 137 pounds. I weighed 155 when I went to Vietnam. I weighed 137 when I came home. And my actual discharge date was August the 29th, 1968. And then Caden was born August the 29th. 2006. So he was uh, but then I didn't get released until I always said my discharge date was uh, August the 30th because at 6 o'clock in the morning I've got the picture of me standing a buddy of mine took with my uniform on and it was taken at 6 a.m. August the 30th that's when they released us but they must have signed the official discharge papers before midnight and then they were getting, getting us fed and getting our uniforms and stuff. Because Paula was looking at my DD-214, she said, I thought you said you got out August the 30th, 68. I said, I did, that's when I got out and got home. She said, your discharge papers say August 29th. And I'd never noticed it. They put these on in California, the National Defense, Vietnam Service, Vietnam Campaign, Vietnamese Gallantry with Cross, and then the Army Good Conduct Medal. So those are the five, five awards I got. And then expert with a carbine and an M16. And then I was a sharpshooter with a pistol 
but then I was only a basic marksman with DM6, the DM14 when I went through basic training. Uh, there was such a difference between shooting an M14, it was heavier like an M1 and zero and in on it. You didn't have all the windage and elevation sights that you did on the M16 and it was so light shooting off the sandbags. Once you got your elevation and windage and everything set on an M16, it was, I mean, there was no kick to it and like there was an M14, so I, I qualified expert with it. And then you had a, I remember shooting an M14, they, when you're shooting and you're down there, you keep your thumb locked up here, you know, when you're shooting, I said, don't hold it out or you'll get a mouse. And you can tell the guys who, they'd be black and blue under here and have a little mouse under their eyes. And then I, I had an M60 on the gun jeep when I was in Vietnam, but I, I never qualified for an M60. And they said, here it is, use it. I remember the first day I was down in the village, Coochie and my sergeant, his name was Bobby Richardson. And uh, I was riding the gun that day, the M60. He said, you know how to use that thing? I said, yeah. He said, show me. So I closed it and had the bandolier in there and I popped off about 40 or 50 rounds out into a rice paddy. He said, that sounds good, doesn't it? I said, yeah, it works. <laughs> I had a buddy, I spoke with pieces. You ever stop to figure out how much you cost the United States government, how much ammo you waste? I said, I'm not wasting it, I'm practicing. Target practicing and shooting it to make sure the thing's functional. And you know, there was one day, an M60, uh, it's got a plug on the end of it. You unscrew it and it comes out and if you put that thing in, you gotta put it in the way where the hole is and you stick your finger down in it. If you put it the other way, it'll only fire one round at a time. And whoever had that gun the day before I did and cleaned it, and I came out of the base camp in an open area out there just to kind of a test your weapons, and I hit that trigger, pop. So what? Hit it, pop, pop. I thought, oh crap! What if we come out that morning and, and got hit? So I unscrewed it real quick and I said, "Look, whoever had this yesterday, I'd like to know who it was." And put it in, so I put it back in and fired it off, and it, it fired on automatic. But, uh, Never know. And it wasn't too long after that, they did get hit going out that morning. And I was sitting in front of the company area. We were getting ready to marshal up a convoy to take out. You could hear the automatic weapons fire. I thought, what in the heck? And then a squawk come over the radio, you know, got a guy down, need help. He's going up the back, the back way. And went out there, a guy's name is Wakeoff. He was laying in the road and he got shot and he, he lost a lung over it. And uh, they said, we need help now. And I said, let's go. And I was driving that day, and the guy who was riding gunner, and the guy who was riding shotgunner, I, of course, a four speed, I popped the clutch, took off, threw the guy out of the back of the Jeep. And we just kept going, get down there to help. And came back, and he had a slight concussion, and they put him in the hospital for observation overnight, and I went over to see him. He said, hey, he said, it wasn't your fault. You said, let's go. He said, I should have been hanging on. He said, I was, but I wasn't holding on tight enough. He said, he took off like a bat out of hell. <laughs> I said, yeah. But, uh, so he was all right. So I didn't. And then today, <clears throat> those gun jeeps had the tarps over the top of them, but they didn't use those in Vietnam. And so that bar that goes up to help support the top of it, most of them they had cut off. We had one or two jeeps that nobody had ever cut them off and people get hung up on them and it was kind of sprung and we were on the way to Tate in one day and got got hit and so the guy who was driving the Jeep jumped out, the guy who was riding shotgun, I grabbed the M60 off and I jumped off the back of the Jeep and that stupid bar was sprung and it was raised up about that far and I got my foot hung up in it. So when I fell off, I was lucky I didn't break my ankle. I'm, I'm hanging and machine guns down and I had it, didn't have a safety on and my finger hit it and it fired off, you know, 10 or 12 rounds into the dirt and the dirt road and those guys are in the ditch. And uh, so finally I dropped the, the M60. It, that's what stopped it from shooting, the, the weight of it, pulled it out of my hand and it was laying on the ground. So I got myself pulled back up in the Jeep and got my foot untangled 
And I jumped off and we got back. First thing I did, I had him cut that thing off. I said, you about cost some major problems today with that thing on there. We told you before to get them all off of there. And uh, I rolled, got the machine gun and rolled over into the, to the ditch with the guys. And this buddy of mine looked at me and he goes, who in the hell side are you on anyway, Audie Murphy? <laughs> and I laughed. It wasn't funny when it happened, but later on we, we laughed about it. I, I, I was looking to see you know, if somebody was hit. If I'd have hit somebody, I'd have, I'd have felt terrible. They said, who in the hell side are you on? <laughs> I said, well, couldn't help it. But, uh, that's pretty much the stuff that's here. It just continues to grow all the time.